Welcome to the Film Trooper podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent. This is the podcast where we focus on making and selling your film for online self-distribution. And a perfect way to get started is to pick up the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it. It's available as a paperback in a Kindle ebook format, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com and sign up with Audible for their free trial. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. And speaking of audio, in today's episode, which is entitled Sound Recording and Mixing Tips for Your Indie Film, we are joined by Sam Edgness, who has worked as a production sound recordist and supervisor for several indie films and is working as a mix technician for such shows like Game of Thrones. I don't know if you've heard of that show or not before, but it's, you know, it's Game of Thrones. Anyway, Sam is here to give us tips on how we can record and mix better sound for our indie film. But I also encourage you to go to the blog post that accompanies this podcast episode over at filmtrooper.com forward slash 122 or 122 since this is episode number 122 or 122. Anyway, when you go there, you'll see that I've written and curated a collection of useful videos and articles that will help you get better sound for your indie film. Again, that's at filmtrooper.com forward slash 122. Now, without further ado, here is Sam Edgness on the Film Trooper podcast. Uh, thank you again. I can't thank you enough. I know how busy uh, you've been. Um, but I was curious, you know, when we met um, very, very briefly, um, you know, I think Maria Menounos swept in, picked off as many Emerson college students as she could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and said, let's uh, make this independent film. At that time, it was called Serial Buddies. I think it ended up becoming The Adventures of the Serial Buddies. Um, and when we had met you know, I was just on my way out because there was a family emergency that I had to take care of that mm -hmm. uh, prevented me from like staying on the long haul of the production. So I was just there at the very beginning, um, kind of handling, you know, or, you know, the productions of things, getting kind of a lot of stuff in order. Um, but you were very specific, You're like, yeah, I'm here for the sound, you know, sound recording and do on location sound recording. Um, what was it called to you? What was like the, the title? that was given to you and, that, and like that independence um, spectrum? Is it just sound recordist? That would have been a production sound mixer would have been that title. Um, okay. And that's actually one of the, one of the things that I find a lot in doing smaller independent projects is there is a lot of question of what, what do you get called? What is, you know, what is your title um, at all, at all levels of, of the sound side of things um, from the production sound mixer and the boom operator working on set to the uh, the sound editor and the sound re-recording mixer in mm -hmm. post-production. And uh, that's uh, especially when it comes time to do credits at the end of a movie, there's always that question of like, what, what do I call you? What are you doing? <laughs> well, let me ask you, so you, you went to Emerson, you know, film school in Boston. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, what's the full name of the, the college? It's, it is Emerson College. Um, I was in the film program. It was the uh, School of the Arts uh, film program. Uh, so yeah, I was there. I was focused on a, an audio sound design. I was actually there, I think, the first year they made that distinction. Um, previously, it had just sort of been an audio general thing. So audio sound design, radio, all of that was all in one. Uh, when I came in, it was very, it's when they started to focus it more. So, you know, I didn't have to take classes on doing air checks or, you know, working at the radio station. I, I did work at the radio station, but that was completely unrelated. Um, <laughs> it was more of something fun to do. Uh, yeah. So I originally went into college uh, back in high school. I had started DJing, I was recording local bands, and I kind of fell into sound that way. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I got to Emerson with the idea of, I'm not really sure what I can do with this, you know, as a job. Maybe I'll record bands. And I got there and they're like, well, the music industry is not quite the same thing, but there's this whole <laughs> thing about mixing movies. And I went, well, I'll try that. And uh, here, here I am. Yeah, so because it's, it's very interesting because it's like, you know, a lot of people going into the film track at any, you know, college is sort of there to like make their own films. Everybody's like a writer, director, producer type hybrid or then a lot of them that or, you know, 
like a percentage of them end up going to like cinematography or director of photography stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. and then, uh, but it's very rare that you find uh, a handful of people that are just like, I just want to do sound, sound recording, sound design, sound mixing. Uh, So it's really fascinating to see, you know, you're coming out of college on that particular project that we met on and then, you know, tracking your career, just like, you you know, you know, nose to the grindstone and just you know, one thing after another, one project after another, and, and found yourself. When did you move out to LA? I moved out to LA a little over seven years ago now. Um, Emerson had a great program uh, that you'd come out, do a semester, take a class or two, and get an internship, um, which is just, it's a great way to sort of get your feet wet and come to LA without having to make the full, you know, oh, I'm an unemployed recent college grad, and well, I guess I'll just move to this city across the country and figure it out. Um, kind of gives you Emerson gave that sort of jump start of go ahead move see what you think check <laughs> it out you know meet people try and get job leads before you move out which was really helpful in, in my case it worked out really well um, I interned at a small studio in Burbank and then I was lucky in that the timing worked out that my internship turned into a full-time job. Ah, um, nice. Wasn't doing sound. It was doing more um, video support, um, helping picture editors uh, import and end output you know, shows and doing laybacks with occasional audio jobs here and there. Um, but while I did that, I started to get back in touch with a lot of people I had gone to school with who were already living in L.A. and had already graduated Um, And they were making their own little projects. So, you know, by day I would be laying back some, you know, game show and then I'd go home and mix a web series for a friend of mine and just kind of keep myself doing some sound. Eventually, yeah, eventually I hit a point where I was getting so much uh, freelance work coming in that I, you know, I had to start turning things down. And that was around the time I decided I should you know, try this out full time and uh, quit my job, went freelance for full time doing all kinds of indie projects uh, and uh, yeah, did that for a couple of years before finally landing at a facility. What facility is it that you're, are you still currently with this facility? Uh, I got hired at Todd AO or Todd Sound Deluxe at the time mm-hmm. in March of 2014. In June of 2014, they uh, <laughs> they went bankrupt, which was a very sad time for everyone. They're yeah. one of the oldest companies in town, um, and you know they've been doing sound for 50 some odd years. Um, but they went away, and I ended up landing at a place called Audiohead. And oh yeah, and kicking around there um, now become the Formosa Group, and that's where I'm working these days. I see, I see, very nice. So, when you're um, for like the indie indie filmmaker, like uh, you know, most most of the time, you know, the sound production, sound recording, a recordist, or um, what's the title again? <laughs> the production sound mixer, yeah, <laughs> production sound mixer. So the production sound mixer normally in an in independent film is the person. They could also be the boom operator, right? So they could. They're operating the boom or they're uh, maybe attaching uh, lavalier mics on the actors and they're running, you know, sound into a small recorder or a type of recorder. Um, They take that sound, you know, back into post. Um, They clean it up, get it ready for the editor. uh, And then I I guess it goes back and forth and the editor finishes, uh, you know, their lock picture, picture lock. You take it and do sound design, sometimes, you know, independent um, production that type of you know role you, i could see that a lot with a lot of produ- um audio um super, you know professionals um was that the case for a lot of the independent films you were working on from like start to finish were you um you know taking it or were there times where you only worked on set for a little bit but most of your specialty came in the post side of things it's a bit of both yeah um definitely a lot more often in indie film you'll see um a uh the person who's on set then do the post-production as well um that i did a few of those projects where i would you know record it they would you know take it cut it i would get it clean up the dialogue edits add sound effects remix everything and you know do any adr as needed um but the uh 
a lot of the work that I did um, would actually just be, you know, we have this project, it's been shot, it's been cut, we need a sound mix, um, are you available? And that was the majority of what I did, um, especially after I did a string of shoots and during, the, we had a heat wave here in LA a few mm-hmm. years ago, it was awful. Um, I did a series of shoots during that heat wave and that was about the time <laughs> I went, I think I'm done doing onset sound. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, since then I've done maybe one or two location sound shoots just for friends who you know, I'll always work for. And um, other than that, yeah, it's mostly been in post in a nice, comfortable studio. Nice. Now, can you let's let's have fun. Like so when an indie you know, independent filmmaker doing web series or a short doing a feature um, there when they come to the the. The, the moment of to think about sound and, uh, as it's being recorded on location or on set. Um, what are like sort of the, the don'ts you're supposed to do? Like, you know, I, you, you tell us everything like, well, you should do this, but it's always more fun to say, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> Let's well, have the fun with the don't do's. <laughs> the don't do's. Well, I think it's actually, if you're only starting to think about sound once you're on set, it may already be too late. Um, uh, it's something that I encounter a lot of in, I mean, a lo- in almost all levels now is, um, you know, you find a production, you find a, a, a location. It's awesome. It's great. It looks perfect. It's also right next to a freeway and the end of a landing strip of the local airport. Uh, having an eye <laughs> for that sort of stuff in pre-production before you've even started shooting anything when you're still scouting locations you know knowing that oh you know this location is great but none of the dialogue we get here will be usable or um you know this location it's fine it's also next to a freeway we could probably find something better uh something like that just keeping sound in mind as you're preparing yeah yeah but i um yeah Sorry, hang on a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, we're all good. <laughs> so yeah, keeping sound in mind as you prepare, because you know, you, you're you going through, when you're making a project, there's so many things that have to happen before you can even start shooting. And I always, it's always great when sound, even remotely can be a consideration. Like, don't forget about sound. Don't forget about it until suddenly like, you're on set and there's a boom that you know is dangling dangerously out right out of frame (laughs) and you're you know don't let that be the first concern right right let me ask you um on indie indie level uh, a lot of times it's they'll just use like one microphone it'll be like a shotgun Mm -hmm. microphone going into like um like a task cam you know dr100 or a a, you know the the zoom yeah yeah, we everybody had the zoom um and prior to that you know, obviously, I don't know what you cut your teeth on. Was it like DAT tapes or DAT recorder? Or did you ever work on the bigger, more analog, the old school, um, you know, what's it they call the Nagas or something? Yeah, um, my, my very first student film that I ever did, um, and this was more of a, you know, they just wanted us to have experience with the gear, uh, was on a Nagra. I Nagra, had yeah. A, yeah, I had a quarter inch tape, one microphone, um, the battery pack was, I think, like 25 pounds. Um, yeah, uh, so I I have used Inagra. Um, I was lucky that I never did have to use any of those, the DAT machines. Mm-hmm. Um, in speaking to a lot of people today, they're like, yeah, you know, it was a stopgap. It worked fine, but we're never going back to those. Right. Um, what um, I, What is the evolution now? Like, so it's the old Nagras, um, DAT tape was a little like in between before the mm-hmm. digital um, technology took over. So what are larger productions? What are like, what is, like I said, the smaller productions are usually using these small like task cams or uh, zooms um, uh, recorders, but then, or some of you were going right into camera, you know, with like, yeah. you know, with some sort of uh, adapter for the XLR sometimes into a, mm-hmm. the mini. But what have you seen sort of on the, like the professional end of things, uh, what are they using that's different than the indies? You see a lot more on larger films, uh, multi-channel uh, uh, recorders that can, you know, take 8, 12, 16, 
inputs and record them each to their own individual file. Um, and then for editorials sake, they'll make a, a mix track of all of those so that editorial, when they go to start cutting the, the, the picture, they don't have to carry 16 tracks of audio along with the video because that's just cumbersome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll start to see, um, you know, sound devices, uh, seven series and the six series mixers, which have actually really, you know, just recently come out and they're pretty awesome. Um, then uh, up above that, you start to see things from companies like Zaxcom and um, uh, there's another I'm missing. There's a handful of people who still really enjoy Aton. Aton is kind mm -hmm. of this more esoteric, but very, very cool and very robust system. And um, yeah, that's for the most part. And then there's some productions which have, you know, they're set up on a sound stage. They're big. They have, you know, they don't have to move around a lot. They'll have a sound cart that'll have a computer with a bunch of interfaces. And it's essentially like a recording studio. However many, however many inputs they need, they have. Um, that's very common, uh, especially in sort of TV shooting they'll have you know a, a mixer a giant mixing console that can record however many you know linked up to a computer to record however many tracks they need nice nice yeah and so, so like scales yeah so um it was you know like you see different productions where they might have you know multiple boom operators because mm -hmm. each one is uh, um, focusing on you know one particular performer versus the other um as well as a lot of times these performers sometimes will also be mic'd up, you know, hidden lobs, you know, yeah. um, and what kind of, uh, so there, there's multiple sources going forward. Whereas the indie level is usually one source. <laughs> well, it's usually one source or in the, a lot of cases it's maybe a multiple sources, but they've been mixed down and married together. Um, mm -hmm. A common thing that I would see on a lot of the indie shoots I'd work on and others, you know, that I would get is, yeah, everyone would be wearing a wireless mic, but then all of those wireless mics would be crushed together in one track on like a Zoom H4. Oh, and yeah. So you'd have one channel of boom and one channel of wireless, but it's all of the wireless. Now, here's a thing that I remember, um, it, it was a little simple trick that I learned later, but it was uh, Ed Burns. Um, so he went and he made his film Newlywoods. He had a mm -hmm. small crew of, you know, the DP just had the 5D, and then they were using the Zoom H1, I think. It's a tiny, like $90 uh, digital recorder, uh, yeah. and it has like a mini in, so it's uh, not XLR. But they bought like these uh, Logitech powered um, lavalier. So it's a battery powered lavalier that goes into those H1 mics. They're tiny. Mm -hmm. And each actor had their own. So it, what they weren't dealing with wireless. So it wasn't like a transmitter needed to go to uh, a, a, another sound recording device. And it wasn't going to camera. And uh, they recorded their dialogue that way. And it, in, and like you said, whereas other people might in in, in the indie world might have the wireless lobs go, lobs going on, um, but they all come into like one H, you know, one or H and I can't get my my numbers correct. But one of the it's it's alphabet soup. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but one of the one of the recorders, like you said, and all the tracks get you know can record at once, which is very yeah difficult, interesting. So trying to keep it all separate. Like not only separate microphones uh, for the performers or the recording area, but they have to go into their own track or own recording system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, f and figuring out some other cheats that way. What other interesting cheats or tips that you saw on the indie level that could easily improve the the recording sound? Number one, knowing what location you're going to be in, you know, to mm -hmm. have sound in mind. Number two. Try not to compress all the sound, you know, uh, if you have multiple sources, don't record it into one device. But is there any other little tricks that you saw that could be very useful um, for the indie space that you've learned on the bigger side of things? Well, it's actually interesting. In the last, I think, year, actually, um, there have been a couple of releases, uh, some new hardware. Zoom specifically has released something called the, I think it's the Z8 or something like that which is 
uh, very similar to something a bit more, you know, uh, sound devices, 744, for example, which is a four channel hard disk recorder. It costs like upwards of three to $4,000 new. Um, Zoom has released something that has an eight channel recorder. Um, so, you know, you can, you know, have a microphone on everyone on a set and get their own individual tracks recorded. And that thing, I think it's under a thousand dollars. It's very affordable quality wise. It's, you know, the sound devices always will sound better, but compared to getting, you know, on camera audio or just everything crushed to one track, the fact that these options exist now and a fairly affordable space is pretty great. And it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, especially as more and more people are shooting larger scale indie projects. Um, and, you know, I think that's just sort of being aware of what equipment is available and, and maybe being being able to budget just a hair more for for these these little upgrades. They can go a long, long way, especially come post-production. Yeah, I just um, looked it up online. It, you're right. It's the Zoom F8 multi-track yeah. field recorder. That's the one. And there it is. You just bring it in and eight channels of separate recording. That's fantastic. And like you said, it's nine ninety nine ninety nine. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> Under it's, it's really great. And um, compared to where we were even, you know, three years ago where we're just like, oh, okay, well, you know, you have everyone's wearing a wireless but you know, <laughs> the mix track has everything all at once. So, you know, when this actor sneezes, he destroys the other person's lines and this and that. And now there's a <laughs> bit of separation. Um, another kind of cool recent thing, um, there are, we're starting to see a lot more iPhone and just generally phone-based um, Hang on a second. I That's got right. a meowing cat in the back. I hear you. <laughs> So we're starting to see a lot more phone-based recording uh, setups, which is really interesting, uh, especially as it gets a bit more developed, where very similar to what you were just saying, where they had um, the little mini zooms in their pockets mm -hmm. um, just to record the dialogue that way. There's um, Sennheiser, which makes you know yeah. the most uh, number of the labs that people use all the time. They have a product... Uh, that plugs directly into the lightning port on the, your iPhone. And it's it's a lavalier that has a, instead of a mini or an XLR, it has a lightning at the end of it. And you plug that in and you can record directly to the phone and get dialogue that way. And that's pretty cool. Um, logistically, I'm not totally sure how it all works in post, how everything gets linked back up. But yeah. um, just from a capture standpoint, that's having that option. And, you know, the problem with low, low cost wireless uh, is, you know, you get wireless hits all the time. You get like those RF interference and oh God, it's distorted. Yeah, yeah. You, you know it well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and when you're when you're dealing with this, you're ha you get a good lav, a good sort of recording. And since it's getting recorded directly to the device, you don't have to worry about these wireless hits. You just, you know, as long as everything is syncable in post, it's not yeah. a bad option. No, I just, yeah, thank you. I just looked it up too. It's this uh, Sennheiser Clip Mic Digital, uh, Clip Mic Digital powered by Apogee. It's, That's it. Uh, they sell a B and H for two hundred dollars, but uh, one ninety nine. But you're right. I mean, it's everybody has like an iPhone or some kind of device that can record the audio. Um, so having, you know, you just spending money on the that mic is way better because wireless technology for the la the lavaliers um is so brutal if it's not the high end like i don't i don't mm -hmm. think i've ever experienced anything in the low end that actually worked like unless you like like they have to be like not moving <laughs> yeah pretty much not moving at all and these are all like really great options um for you know getting a decent recording that will help you a lot in post Oh but, yeah, um, it's and the this the clip mic one especially is is cool, but it's not to belittle the importance of having a a really good sound person on set to to you know 
help mitigate problems, sort of bring them up. Part of part of being a production sound mixer is is going up to you know listening. It's, it, we're we're not just there to record. We're we're there to listen to everything that's happening. To to be like, well, hey, you know this this light is causing a problem. This the power supply for this light is calling a causing a problem, which is often the case actually because mm-hmm. like could we cover it can we you know buffer it somehow or are you hey, like hearing a hear hum or like a pulse or something yeah um the biggest the best example i have is um hmi lights um, oh. the, the heads themselves emit a kind of a high frequency sound but that you know that's kind of unavoidable but then the ballast the the actual box that they draw power from also creates a lot of noise um, so when possible, you know, having that conversation with lighting department and being like, Hey, could we not have these really noisy boxes sitting next to the actors and, you know, mm-hmm. trying to mitigate sound or noise problems before they become problems, you know, like the camera, Oh, Hey, we can, you know, it's not so much a problem anymore, but you know, when we would be shooting on film, it'd be like, I can hear the film going through the camera on this <laughs> shot. Can we put a, a sound blanket over it? Something like yeah. that. But now when you get into like the, the mixing part of it, like, um, and you know, working on, um, like I, I want to get to it later, but you know, you've worked on, you know, game of Thrones currently. And I love to hear that, that process of like, what materials do you get in terms of of your responsibility with the the the, the mix technician, and then versus the indies, you know, like what are the god awful things that come through? You're like, oh no, this I got to work with this file or a file like this. Um, what from a standpoint of a, like a mix technician or or a sound designer coming in from an indie side of things that you see like any other additional tips that we were like, Oh, if they had just done this, if they had made sure that when they were recording the audio, that they weren't in a, a room that had hard walls that were the sound, just sound just, you know, bouncing and just mm-hmm. felt like this hollow empty, you know, it just, it sounds bad as opposed to if they just put some blankets or, you know, against the walls or on the floor, you know, something to soften, um, the, the spaces. I was just curious of any other tips or things that you see, because I know, like, you know, from the editing standpoint, you know, if you're a visual effects artist, sometimes if you're in the compositing side of things, you always see everything at the last. You're, you're, you have to compile all the, the elements. So you know what things work and what don't work, you know, what things you need and you don't need. Same as an editor, you know, as a filmmaker to be able to edit their own stuff, to understand, like, when they're on set and shooting something, they know in the back of their mind, like, you know what, I, I'm not going to even need that. But I do need, like shots or coverage this way because it's always mm-hmm. helpful in the edit so from the standpoint of a, a sound professional what do you see in the post end that you're like ah i wish that th- th- they would have got the you know the raw material be- you know delivered this way better or any other advice for the indies that maybe we haven't covered already give us coverage it's the same <laughs> thing with the picture department we need coverage of things um it's super helpful uh, uh, something that I've seen done and I've done myself when I'm on set is, um, you know, we'll do a scene and if time allows, I'll, um, I'll try and get the actors to just do the scene again, but you know, without cameras rolling, um, just to have them in the space without any movement around, without any cameras and allowing me to sort of, you know, get right up in there with a boom and, get a clean recording of, of the lines and, you know, they may not match a hundred percent, but just having that flexibility to, you know, cut in an alternative take of, you know, well, this one word, you know, you can hear the dolly jingle and it's not something we can easily repair in this particular case, but we have that word in this other take. Um, we can cut that in and that sort of stuff happens a lot. Yeah. So just getting coverage and, um, giving, the mixer on set a little bit of time. I mean, I know there's never enough time. That's <laughs> that's the case all the way from indie to, you know, giant features. There's never enough time. And um, just giving the mixer a little bit of time to get things like room tone, um, super helpful, mm-hmm. uh, or recording anything in the environment or on the set that's interesting or unique that could you know help 
you know, sell the movie a little bit like, um, on, uh, well, actually a great example going back would be on serial buddies. There was a vehicle that was very, you know, not a commonly used car that you would see a lot as a Ford Pinto. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, there were a lot of scenes inside that car. So we tried while we were on set to grab sounds of it, just like, you know, nothing else was going on. I'm like, I'm going to record, you know, the doors or something. And just to have that down the line so that, you know, you don't have to go like, oh, I don't have a Ford Pinto, you know, trunk door creak and close that quite matches the one in the production, this and that. Right. Uh, um, so just, you know, kind of trying to, think be conscious in the same way that you would be with picture of you know i don't need this whole scene but i do want to pick up these little inserts and pick up these shots just for coverage um it's nice to have that in sound when you get to the post stage or else so you're not tied so you're not like oh well every time we were rolling the actor really really screamed this out and all of the audio is distorted and you know, we should <laughs> yeah, have just yeah. gotten one slightly tamer one on set so we don't have to bring this person in for adr and right. ADR right. is notoriously difficult for everyone. Just Yeah. What do you call do you just call it coverage or do you call it wild? Like so I I I remember, you know, like like you said you're on set and the, if the actors run the scene and when the before when the director says cut, we're moving on before you say move on, like goes cut. Yeah, okay, that's everything's great. Um is there a term that you use is called recording wild or like a the poor man's ADR? <laughs> yeah. I mean, wild. I would, I would log that on my, on my sound log as a wild track. Okay. Um, same with sort of any of those sounds I'd mentioned the, anything that doesn't synchronize directly to a shot picture, I would mark as wild. So I don't have the editor in post or the assistant editor in post sitting there going like, where the heck is the slate? What's the take that this lines up to? I don't understand right. what's happening. Um, so yeah, just, you know, that's, I guess another thing is please do everything you can to keep track of all of the media you generate when you're shooting a film. <laughs> um, cause there's so many times where I'm going through and they're just like, here are the dailies. And they hand me a hard drive with, you know, 40 gigs of audio and, it's all like audio track o one dot wave and just, yeah oh no <laughs> okay guys yeah let's yeah figure this out well I remember um it's almost like I I remember referring to that the recording wild is like you know um in the indie side is like assuming you're never gonna get your actors back for any ADR so you can mm -hmm. be on set and do like a poor man's ADR which is all right you know the same thing let's just record redo the scene. Get all get all that um, dialogue nice, and I get the microphone as close as possible, um, and you know because actually, really, reality TV does it quite a bit. I think like Fra Franken bits, you know, when oh, you yeah. watch you know reality TV, they are purposely switching out uh, dialogue to make you think that that person said something they didn't. So they they taken something like you know like a word like bitch or something, and then it had no context, but they do it all the time. So. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if reality TV can do it, you know, the indies can do it as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I've, I've had my fair share of, of Frankenbites to, yeah. to, to work with. So you get that. So we have coverage, lots of coverage, time, you know, the, the room noise is important. And, and for those who don't understand, why is room noise, uh, the, the, you know, recording a room tone and room noise so important in the post-production process? When it comes time to do the the dialogue edit which i guess i have to sort of back up into that as well um after the 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 show or whatever has been cut together picture wise it comes to you know the sound department and we'll do what's called a dialogue edit where we go through and try and smooth out all of the different takes um, different angles make it all sound make the stuff shot on set the dialogue sound as smooth and uniform and and um together as we can in doing so uh, a lot of the times we have to sort of balance the background noise because um, any space is going to have background noise um, even if you're sitting in the room you're like oh it's dead quiet in here once the minute you put a microphone on you're going to hear like uh, you know the guy upstairs turning on his shower or <laughs> you know, anything like that so having that available just 
the room tone, the, the, the sound of the room available as a wild track uh, can be very useful in helping smooth out transitions between, say, on one shot you have a certain type of light hum, and then on the other reverse shot you don't have that light hum. Yeah, You can use the room tone to sort of even it out so you don't have this tone coming in and out and in and out every time you cut the picture. And yeah. the idea is we want to make it so seamless that you don't hear the cuts happening. Because if you hear the cuts happening, you become aware of the edit and then you become aware that you're watching a film and you're taken out of the story. Right. So that's why, you know, you you can hear it too. I've, you know, a lot of like maybe web series or something like that, you can hear that they don't have time for Foley or proper sound mix. They're just like literally just taking whatever sound they recorded on location and they're doing their best to, you know, even it out. Like they might have like a, you can hear it in the mix where it's like, there is like this underlying sort of outdoor sound. And then all of a mm-hmm. sudden when they, the actors start talking, there's like a ramp up where you can hear like the volume got turned up and then when they're not talking it comes down like it's not very you know evened out so you can totally see like when those those spots pop up uh, or here I should say you can hear it pop up so let me ask you so you have what sort of on the indie side of things have you seen what are what software are people using to do the uh, sound editing and the sound mixing uh, and the sound design Um, you know um, because I've seen you know a lot of different various tools. Obviously, Pro Tools seems to be like the one for a long time, but I don't know whether or not that has changed or people are using other other things like Logic or Audition, you know, for sound, um, you know, sound design, sound editing, sound mixing. What yeah, have you seen? It, ha- it has changed a bit at the indie level. Um, I personally, I still use Pro Tools um, day in, day out. It's pretty much the Microsoft word of my industry at this point. <laughs> right. Um, and a lot of people working in post use Pro Tools, but it's not as you know synonymous as it once was. Um, a lot of people, especially more towards the design side of things, are using programs like um, some use Logic. Logic is kind of difficult to work with picture in, mm-hmm. um, but some people are using a, an application called Reaper. Reaper, okay. Um, Reaper is, it's actually a pretty cool application. I've sort of looked into it a little bit, but haven't had time to really dive deep. But um, Reaper gives a lot of flexibility, and the buy-in for Reaper, it's fairly low cost, and it gives you, I think, the ability to then export your material to take to you know Pro Tools, to a, a bigger place should you have you know the ability and the budget but for the most part yeah it's it's a lot of pro tools um almost all of the big facilities in town will use pro tools and if your indie has enough to, you know money to go to even a even a mid-size or small facility chances are they're going to be working in pro tools got it got it so then is um what is the process so like we go So we've covered so far that you're on location, you know, you want to think about sound prior to shooting in terms of knowing what the location's problems might be, airport, you know, uh, large AC, when the garbage men come, when the people are blowing leaves, you know, Mm -hmm. and knowing when the garden crews are out, you know, that type of thing. And as well as taking consideration of trying to separate the audio into different tracks if you can. If you're stuck with one source of, you know, audio recording, understand those limitations. Try to get, uh, make time for the recording wild and recording elements. And then making sure it's tracked, making sure that's logged all the files so it's much easier when post to identify what has been recorded. So you get it into the, um, you know, that, that stage of things. Um, on the post side, are you just cleaning up the audio or just filing it? And then, like I said, you're delivering a, uh, what, what files do you deliver to an editor? Or if you're going to be editing yourself, how do you, how do you, you know, keep your head wrapped around the organization and things, but what's the first step of like cleaning something up and sending it to the editor. And then the editor brings something back to you, the, the, the sound team. And what, what are the, what are those steps? So actually, usually we'll just hand over at the end of the production, we'll hand over all of the audio 
to picture department and then they'll take that and marry it to the picture and um, start cutting. And we, if, you know, you're going to be, if you've recorded it and you're going to be mixing it, you probably won't see that sound again until it shows up after it's all been cut in. Occasionally you may encounter, like they'll send you a scene and be like, hey, is there anything we can do to save this audio? And you'll, you know, take a look at just that scene and go through it and be like, yeah, I can fix it. Or no, we should probably try and ADR this if we can. Um, but typically, yeah, you won't see the sound again until it comes back from the picture editorial department. And that's when we start to go through it and be like, okay, um, you know, start cleaning up the cuts, trying to match backgrounds or match ambient sounds in the, in the dialogue track. And then also, uh, maybe start swapping in alternate takes that, you know, sound this identical, just, you know, with less technical problems and, and whatnot. Right. Right. So what, is there any interesting like nightmares or don't do's that also come from that stage that, that we might be missing that we should uh, be aware of? You know, from like um, an editor editor standpoint. From an editor standpoint, yeah. well, I know it's not always an option on uh, smaller projects, uh, but having a good assistant editor or someone who is just familiar with the ins and outs of getting files turned over to sound and picture and all that goes a long, long way. Sort of like a, a media manager where on set somebody's dealing with the media management, um, you know, the the footage coming from the camera. You know, that, that role is necessary for the editorial to sound mm -hmm. as well, correct? Yeah. Um, so that person will be tasked with, uh, you know, taking this cut sequence and getting it exported correctly to turn over to sound, um, generating what we call an AAF or an OMF, depending on the editorial system you're working in. Right. Um, and a picture file that would synchronize to that, that OMF or AAF and getting that to the sound department. And I've encountered some times where, you know, it's the editor's first time ever having to turn over to the sound department <laughs> and they'll send me like a really compressed tiny video and a mix down track of everything and i'm like this i can't do anything with this yeah um so having someone who has that experience because you know i have been that person i've been the assistant editor i've you know even back in college, I would be the sound guy people would call to ask, like, how do I export this out of Avid? And I'm like, I, I don't know oh. how I know any of this. But um, <laughs> so I'm usually able to talk people through it, but that's not always the case. You know, I have a, a very strange sort of experience with video as well mm -hmm. as audio in, in having had to support you know, four editorial rooms and a whole server but you know, that's a story for another time yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah uh so there are often times where you know the documentation isn't particularly clear and especially you know now that more and more people are using uh adobe premiere uh which is a you know very full featured and has a lot going for it but there are so many different versions of premiere that people are using and hmm. they have some there's some issues with how certain versions export and then sometimes the menus get changed around it's just very very confusing and very hard to to keep track of sometimes but even even with avid people cutting in an actual avid or the occasional people still using final cut pro 7 or you know mm -hmm. final cut x even um there are just so many different ways to uh export anything to just do anything right and um having someone who's familiar with that process makes the entire thing so much smoother it doesn't you know i'm not sitting on the phone with an editor for an hour trying to figure out how to get a working you know aaf that i can open in my pro tool system from their uh, their premiere because they have someone on their end right right can, 
I can see it's just it's a lot of just time management and where you just want to get to work of like fixing mm-hmm. or cleaning up, and when you realize some of the, you know, I guess the management uh, stuff or you know um, file management aspects of things are not taken care of, it just takes it such a massive time suck. <laughs> it is. It really is, and I think you know it's the technical side of things, especially now, is really really complex and changing very, very quickly. Um, you know, the the fact that everyone's shooting on, you know, digital formats now and every single camera has a different format and how do those <laughs> right. work together and right. like how do you get your GoPro media to play nice with your with your phantom media? How do you get your your DSLR and your, you know, that one shot you got on an Alexa to work right? And it's just <laughs> like it's kind of a mess. And having a tech-minded person on the video side really just makes the entire process down the line easier for turnover to sound, for turnover to you know if they're if you have the uh, the budget, color, and and VFX and online down the line, all that. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. So then you get when you get the um, the files and you start working on the you know clean up the dialogue, um, and then most like post sound facilities they, they try to get everything ready for like even delivery so there's a like separate music and effects track mm-hmm. so if, if, if a product gets sold or whatever it might be is uh the dialogue track can be removed and then it could be replaced with um uh um <laughs> translation i've like lost it what's what they call the local you know, yeah it'd be yeah, redubbed yeah, into local local language yeah right so that's you have to be able to retain all the sound effects and um you know foley and music but you have to be able to make it easy for the, your foreign counterpoint uh, counterparts or whoever might you might be delivering it to so that they can replace mm-hmm. it with their foreign language um the interesting thing is so you 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 get involved you're um in the sound design, how often do you get a chance to work with the actual, the like the creative side of creating sounds that don't exist or finding the right sound? Because that's always fun, that part, yes. you know, like the whole, ben, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you were a fan of Ben Burtz, you know, there's so many documentaries about his work on all the Star Wars films and all mm-hmm. the Lucas films, you know, creating otherworldly sounds. But where does that come into play? Uh, is, or sometimes is is the lines blurred between like the te- you know the mix tech or te- technicians to the sound designers and all that type of things or sound mixers the sound editors there's because we see like in like the Oscars come up there's you know if you could kind of give us a rundown what's the difference between like all the post uh, post responsibilities because we always see in the indie side of things well that's our that's our boom operator who's also a sound guy who will eventually become our production sound mixer, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's a lot more, uh, I've done a lot more indies where I've essentially been credited as sound um, <laughs> because I kind of did everything. Right. So the, the different, the, the breakdown, um, it's sort of a two-parter. Um, so first up, a lot of the roles in post sound we have kind of going from in, I guess in no particular order, but uh, we have the supervising sound editor, which um, is actually kind of pretty self-explanatory. They are the person right. in charge of all of the sound for the post. Um, in some cases, that can also be the sound designer, or maybe they have another person doing just sound design. Um, and the, that, again, is the person creating sounds that don't exist. That's your Ben Burt. That's your... Um, well, I'm just pulling up. That's your Ben Burt. That's your Eric et al. That's your, you know, all of these really great guys who create these these things that don't exist in the real world and do it very, very well. Um, from there, you have your different editors. You have your dialogue editor. You have your effects editor. Um, there are also music editors, but they sort of they tend to fall more into the music department um Mm -hmm. the music editor will typically work very closely with a composer um to make sure that what the composer has you know written and recorded makes it to stage makes it to the final mix and they're there to help you know keep track of all of the music elements of of a of a show and then um, on the mix side, we have the re-recording mixers, which are the people who you know sit behind the console and take all of this material, that editorial 
the you know, sound editorial department has has cut and they take all of that and they combine it and they make the soundtrack that you hear where does the um, does the foley artist they fit in during the sound design uh sessions is that would where they would fit in yeah foley um foley would be sort of yeah while they're editing the sound effects and you know sound effects would be you know hard sound effects is what we call them uh mm -hmm. doors uh big sort of you know the big explosions the big you know the cool stuff if you if you will which is not totally fair because foley <laughs> gets to do some really really cool stuff um but they're doing you know they're cutting in car sounds they're cutting in background ambiences like winds and whatnot uh foley is uh tasked with helping sell movement and create uh sort of a, a realism to the world the foley artists are the people who watch the film and perform moves so they'll do footsteps they'll match their footsteps to a character on screen uh, they'll make sure that they're wearing a similar shoe you know on a similar surface and those guys really get to play and i've i've chatted with a few foley artists and they are they love their jobs because honestly, <laughs> it's it's really cool. Um, Foley stages are always kind of a disaster to the eye. You walk in, there's just stuff everywhere. But then once you see what they do with that stuff, it's amazing. Um, you know, things like you know, man picks up a, a mug on off of a table, and they you know they do it and they make it sound like a mug, but also not. And that's the other thing with sound is you can be literal with sound, but sometimes the way something actually sounds is really boring. Oh yeah. Oh totally. Like it's a, you 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 do it you're like oh, my, that doesn't sound like anything that what's I yeah. think it should sound or cinematically, yeah. Yeah, gunshots are the biggest. Uh, most people <laughs> the first time they actually shoot a gun or hear a gun in real life they're like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um so, where's the reverb? Where's my bass? Yeah. It sounds like a I this this is really sad, but like you know, my daughter's in high school now. And I have to, I, this is the world we live in. I have to have conversations with her about school shootings yeah. and, and like be aware and, and conscientious of your, like an ex escape route or something. And I said that when it happens or if it does happen, ugh, you know, it's like, it won't sound like the movies. You're going to no. hear it sound like a popcorn. It would sound like this high pierced pop, but you're not sure what it is. Um, that's, you know. It won't be like this deep bass, you know, sound per se. And so she's yeah. like, you know, it's weird how these conversations. It is. But, yeah. yeah. But it's true. It's, you know, every every gun is a cannon in in the movies. But it's, you know, we 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 are narratively heightening that moment so that it's it's more impactful. And, you know, there are times where we do put in a realistic gun sound specifically to, you know, make a point like. You know, there may be a situation where a guy is just shooting a gun wildly and it's not doing anything to stop the onslaught of monsters or whatever. And, right. you know, that's narratively important to that point because, you know, it's not stopping them. It's not enough. But that's that's what we try and do. And from the editorial side all the way through Foley and the re-recording mix, the final mix, is we're trying to take what we're seeing on screen and make it bigger and more impactful because the dialogue is incredibly important mm -hmm. dialogue is what tells your story but we can support the dialogue in so many ways with sound effects even just a background we've you know uh i think a great example you know you have a, a lot going on music and then suddenly it starts to get very quiet and then you know the crickets go away and everyone starts to get really tense and you start to sell this this mood and this feeling and then that's when you know the giant alien robots attack and yeah. there you go um but getting back to what we were <laughs> getting back to the the different roles um yeah sorry i didn't mean to get tangent oh no remember. yeah yeah i love those kinds of tangents they're always <laughs> fun um the uh the re-recording mixers take all that material and and make it you know a seamless single sound track um, and generally speaking on film and TV, there are two of them working t in tandem. Um, but a lot of times in indies and smaller projects, there will just be one person doing everything. 
um, the split between the two is usually sound effects and um, one one mixer just does effects. So that'll be backgrounds, effects, Foley, what have you. And then the other mixer will handle dialogue and music. Okay. And that's usually how that split works. There are situations where it changes off. Um, and then on shows, uh, bigger shows usually, or um, features, the job that I had been doing for quite a while, uh, this is called the Mixed Tech, mm-hmm. um, I would be tasked with making sure that the stage, the dub stage where we're mixing the giant studio, which is usually like a movie theater, just instead of chairs, there's a mixing console in it. Um, making sure that everything works, um, that all of the material is where it needs to be sort of managing the media in keeping everything in order and working and helping the mixers, uh, in a way so that they don't have to worry about the technical nitty gritty and they can just go and just mix. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of the breakdown of the different roles. Um, there are more specialized sub roles, and sometimes there may be more than one of any given, you know, editor, or there may be co-supervisors. It all depends. Um, but the the real question, um, and which will be on a lot of people's minds in a few months, come time to fill out their Oscar ballads, uh, <laughs> is what the heck is the difference between sound editing and sound Mm -hmm. mixing. Right. So uh, there's a a mixer that I've worked with before gave me the greatest um, (laughs) analogy for this, um, which may actually resonate with your listeners because they have the film background. Um, The sound editor is your production design department. They create this look, this feel around. And then the sound mixer is your director of photography who then takes this look in this world and focuses it in a certain way. Ah, very interesting. That so, is perfect. Yeah. yeah and and um, I, I, I heard that and I went, that is probably the best way to describe the two. Um, because in, in the editorial, you're making these decisions of this is what we're going to have here. These are what these sounds are going to be. And then um, the mixing process, you're going, okay, what are we going to hear at any given moment? And you're sort of focusing the lens on these different sounds that have been cut. And yeah, that's it's really the at the base level, uh, uh, the, the main difference. And if you watch last year's, I think it was yeah last year's Oscar uh, pa- the package they played during those two awards was actually really a good example of that that concept where they took you know the sound editing reel had very you know these are all the sound effects that we had and then the sound mixing one focused very much on different elements of the of the movies sort of weaving in and out and explaining that right right. So with all this, um, you know, you've been on the small side, indie side, going into, you know, working on, you know, huge shows, The Affair, Nashville, Game of Thrones, The Wayward Pines, uh, Selma. What did you, is there any other little tips that, you know, if somebody's running solo, <laughs> you know, when you have mm-hmm. that one indie mm-hmm. person's like, okay, I, I recorded all these sounds on the small indie production. I was by myself. Now I have it, you know, there's just so much, there's only so much time that one single person can do, especially, you know, um, creating their own Foley, you know, and then the ADR, like, and that stands mm. for um, automated dialogue recording, or was it, what is ADR? Uh, automated for? dialogue replacement. Um, replacement. The yeah. automated is kind of a misnomer because it's <laughs> very manual in a lot of ways, but um, ADR is actually, it's kind of a dark art. To be honest, from from my perspective, I've I've shot ADR. Um, I've gotten ADR that people have just like recorded at home, and um, it's made me have a great appreciation for ADR mixers, who are people who specifically just that's their job. They record ADR, and I've had the the I've had the luck to work with some ADR mixers who are awesome and pretty much their track 
their ADR track just drops right in and you're like, oh, okay, great. Moving right along. We don't have to you know, try and make this match. Um, I guess that's, that's actually a good point now that you've brought up ADR. Um, it's something that can really, really, really cause problems in post-production if, <laughs> if not done carefully. Um, iPhone ADR uh, is kind of a growing <laughs> thing that we're seeing. Um, what are they recording? Are, co- are they recording straight into the, the iPhone or do they have mm. a mic set into it? Just right into the iPhone. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> you have probably heard iPhone ADR and in some cases you may have noticed and most hopefully you didn't. Um, but things like that, um, or people just going, Oh, I have a microphone at home. I'll just record my, my dialogue as needed. And recording for ADR is very different from recording for voiceover. Like actually right now I'm, I'm sitting behind, you know, I've got a very nice studio microphone in front of me. Yeah. If I tried to match the sound of my voice to, you know, a very nice shotgun microphone in a room <laughs> with a film crew in it, it's not going to match that well. And it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, yeah, because it sounds like, you know, like you said, there's the room noise, there's the ambient, there's actually space between mm-hmm. the dialogue, like somebody's, uh, you know, saying the dialogue and where the microphone actually was positioned. Mm-hmm. And then it's a, one, it's a different microphone. And then mm-hmm. we all can tell, like when you get into a studio and you have the voiceover, you know, narrator voice, yeah. it sounds different than when you're on location. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's bonkers. I remember, you know, if you look at some classic movies from the 70s and some 80s, um, you'll hear like, like very famous movies like, oh, my God, that was some bad, you know, ADR. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, even um, one of my favorite examples is um, the original Blues Brothers has you know, a lot of musical performances because that's what happens in that movie. Um, But if you listen, there are times where there's dialogue leading into a musical performance. And, you know, that was recorded on set to a, you know, a Nagra, presumably. And then it switches to a studio recording and they start singing and it sounds completely different. And that's, that's a big thing. And, uh, you know, you record differently in a studio than you would on set. You similarly record, you you speak differently in a studio than you would on set. And uh, being able to recapture a performance is one thing, but also, you know, there's the mental block of, you know, I, I have a microphone, it's six inches in front of my face, I'm not going to shout into it. Whereas you may really need to project and you you... Doing some student films, I encountered a lot of times where we would be shooting ADR and the person doing the ADR would, you know, they're trying to get back. You're trying to get back to that headspace you were in. You're trying to get back into that moment, that character to try and match the performance. And that's, that can be really hard. Uh, It's really hard for people who've been doing it for years. And like some people are amazing some people really push for it and but it's it's always it's never easy um and i noticed doing a lot of student film that there would be people who you know come up to their line and they and they would just kind of like you know mumble it because they're right in front of the microphone and and that just would never match so eventually we started you know it's the kind of thing that uh, I've mentioned to ADR mixers now, and they're like, yeah, you didn't know that? And uh, I started moving microphones away and just being like, you know, just have a conversation or just we'd have a person stand by the microphone. Just be like, say the line to them. Talk to this person. Pretend that you're back in this space. And that would help uh, uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Because um, I, you know, when I started out, I, I have a couple of short films that I worked on my first, you know, year or two in college where... The ADR sounds like, you know, radio voice coming in at this time. Having a conversation of, you know, well, I don't know. Why don't you check inside there? And you're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work, does it? (laughs) Very cool. What, um, 
as we wrap it up here, because sure. I, I know it's just an hour here of stuff like that, but I wonder if, you know, what has been the experience, you know, obviously working this this latest company, but, you know, having an opportunity to work on a, a big show like Game of Thrones. Um, and s- do you see anything uniquely different about the approach to the sound design, sound um, sound design, sound editing, the, the mixing of it? Uh, as opposed to uh, some other TV shows or other movies that the uh, the, the post production facility um, sounds facility works on. Well, I can't speak too directly about Game of Thrones just because um, we'd have to probably clear a bunch of it with HBO and they're oh, very gotcha. protective yeah, yeah, of yeah. their stuff. Yeah, um, and also just generally, I don't want to talk too much about what we're doing at Formosa because that's another PR group we'd have to go through. <laughs> I've I've done a handful of times and it's 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 uh, yeah um, it's about as much fun as it sounds. But I can't speak <laughs> to you know working at a high, at at sort of the bigger budget TV film level versus working at the indie level. Sure. Um, sort of in general terms. So you know because indies, independent film. <laughs> okay, Luna. Yeah. Come here. Come here. Bring her, bring her on. <laughs> you have so much to say about this. What do you have to say about indie film? Now she's quiet. <laughs> oh, there, you go. there she is. There she is. All right. All right. I'm almost done. Okay. So independent film, um, you know, budgets are tight. Yeah. Um, equipment is limited usually, and there's not a whole lot of time to do anything. And it's kind of a race to the end all the time, from the time that you start to the time that you finish. And even projects that linger for months or even years to get finished, it's still always a race, you know, uh, to, to, to get everything in order, to make it all work, to, to get all these disparate parts. And especially for a first-time filmmaker, someone who hasn't done it before, it, it's especially difficult. Um, I remember even sitting on set, my very first set, looking around, being like, how the heck does any of this work? <laughs> um, and honestly, there were still days where, you know, I'll be watching something down. I'm just like, I have no idea how any of this came together, but I'm glad it did. Um, something that may actually be kind of surprising is even in bigger productions, a lot of the same things sort of apply. Um, Mm -hmm. there's still not enough time. There's still, you know, equipment's not quite as limited usually. Um, but you know, there's still times where the equipment does fail us. Um, you can never really truly rely on your gear. You always have to rely more on the skills of the people around you. Um, it, at any level. And, uh, It's a lot of times still a race to the finish of, you know, especially in TV where you're like, well, we have air dates. It has to, it has to air. Yeah. <laughs> um, film. I've worked on movies. They're just like, we have to finish Miss Mix today, guys, because this movie comes out in two weeks. That kind of stuff. <laughs> so. Is that why you're uh, like, sometimes I see like your screen names as like Insomniac or something. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, yeah. I've, I've definitely had a couple of days where I went in at, you know, 8 a.m., started working, and then we left at 7 a.m. the next day. Yeah. That's happened. Um, and I've had, you know, indie mixes where, you know, we come in for, you know, we're just going to review, we're going to review something. We're going to watch it down, do a couple notes and that's it. Should take like two hours. Well, you know, 10 hours later, we're still at it. And we're like, oh, okay. Yeah. There was a bit more to do it than we, we thought. Um, so it's, it's not as different as you might expect, which <laughs> kind of surprised me. Um, I think there's a little bit more time. And the budgets are a little bit more forgiving and able to support, you know, the more expensive field recorders and and whatnot. But a lot of the same things apply. And I think a part of that may be that uh, more and more people who were, you know, people who cut their teeth on indie film are, are getting into bigger projects. And it's not that they're bringing that methodology with them. I mean, it's it's what they know, but... 
I think in the last, I guess, five to 10 years, budgets have been shrinking mm -hmm. all over. And yeah. I mean, the rise of reality TV was, you know, a big indicator of this where you've got, you know, all of these shows and things that were fairly cheap to produce kind of taking over. And as more and more content moves to web, um, we're seeing very, very high quality web content out there, which is awesome. Just, you know, very well shot, very, very professional and very, very Hollywood looking web series. And even those are, you know, we're starting to see more of these, these online only things kind of still following the, well, you know, the internet stuff is cheaper. So the budget's going to be a little bit tighter and yeah. you're not going to have as much time as you may want. Um, sort of speaking generally, a lot of TV shows are mixed in, in two days. It's you know not from an editorial may have a week to put it all together or whatnot, but then the show comes together and, you know, everything comes on the stage and you sit down, mix the show. End of day two, it's done. It gets put yeah. down to tape gets shipped off to air. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Um, and yeah. So I think without rambling around as much as I just have, um, it's pretty safe to say that e the, the big difference, there aren't as many differences between independent and, you know, more studio, big budget type productions. I think the only big difference really is, you know, the budget. Um, mm -hmm. maybe the timeline is a bit more forgiving and overages are a bit, you're able to accommodate any overages in time or labor costs a bit better, but yeah, I'm starting to, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, some of the problems that we've had in indie, or we also have in bigger projects, you know? The big yeah. one being, you know, dialogue is rough everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I'm I have the utmost respect for the the people who are dealing with having been on set. I've I've encountered so many situations where I'm like, guys, you know, this dialogue is not going to be usable, and you know, I don't know. I'm trying to find solutions, but they're just like, we 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 have to shoot, we have to go, and that happens so often in even in in the bigger budget sides of things, which is a, yeah, is a shame, but I don't think is all that different from how it always has been. I have the utmost respect for those guys making what they have work as well as they can. And then the dialogue editors that I've worked with um, and that I know and, and keep in touch with these, I've, I'm blown away sometimes by what a good person in post is able to, to, to do, which isn't to say that, you know, okay, just, fix it in post because it's yeah. <laughs> way easier to just fix it in production and shoot yeah. it right the first time. Right. But we have, if, if you're willing to find a person who has the, the skill set to really help and, and really take care of the, the production, take care of the, the product, it goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, as we, I'm trying to think real quick, the, there's so much that there's a lot of information you gave us, which I thank you so much. Cause it's took us through the journey of like, well, when you're in the indie, this is kind of what you're dealing with. Sometimes you're by yourself, but mm -hmm. knowing what the, what the bigger productions do, how many, you know, different responsibilities there are. And you can see while, uh, that particular individual has time to focus and master on that discipline can be very helpful um, uh, on the same time having all these, you know, um, resources and, and a little bit more, a bigger budget to work with yeah. allows for this, this world of sound. Um, is there anything else that I might be missing uh, that would be very helpful? Because all this stuff is fantastic. I just wanted to make sure I didn't uh, cut it, you know, too short um, where I was, where I was missing something that was like, oh man, you know, this is something that most people should probably think about 
like any lasting words of advice before somebody jumps into their production and they're realizing that all they have is their iPhone. <laughs> right. No, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think one of the best bits of advice, and this is something that I've heard echoed by, you know, a lot of people is when you're getting ready to, to shoot, when you're getting ready to make a, a anything, just you're getting ready to shoot a film, a, a web series, a short, whatever. Make sure to when you're budgeting out everything, budget for sound. Don't don't let sound be an afterthought because you've spent presumably all of this time writing this script and perfecting this dialogue and and this creating this whole story. It just seems like such a waste to throw that all away without without keeping sound in mind uh you know it's great okay yeah you have a friend who can get you a really great camera package and lighting package but you know you don't want to spend money on sound but if you don't want to spend money on sound and i'm not saying like you know spend all of your budget on sound because there's you do need to shoot the movie for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah. <laughs> but like you want to be able to, it's so important that you keep sound in mind and that you don't think of it as an afterthought. It's just like, ah, it's this thing that exists because why did you spend all of that time creating this story? Why did you spend all of the time writing all of this dialogue? Why, why write the script at all if you don't care about it being heard? Yeah, exactly. We, um, we have, I put on these uh, Film Trooper Academy, like filmmaking clubs for young people, you know, from like 13 to 18 sometimes. Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises that we did was the kids recreated like, you know, movie trailers. So the dialogue already existed in the movie trailer. So that, because in order for the workshop to work, you know, fast, <laughs> we yeah. had to say like, don't worry about it. We're going to shoot MOS. Um, and then, but here's the existing dialogue. So the kids just like, you know, just like lip synced the, the the dialogue from the original movie soundtrack or the movie <laughs> trailer. So when they put their their footage on top of it, you know, it was just fun. And mm -hmm. but but it was a really interesting exercise because they, they saw like, well, there you go. Like well, let's then we, they wanted to create their own trailer uh, for Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Mm -hmm. So we actually cut and edit the recorded the dialogue completely separately. We actually recreated the 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 soundtrack for the uh, the movie trailer first we hadn't shot anything because the kids were used to shooting um lip syncing to an existing audio track that's how they were used to just making the movie or their little mini trailers so it was fun for them to see like all these sound elements that had to go in and you know so it was, it was like a whatever a minute long piece but it was interesting to see like uh, okay, before we start, here's the edit, the sound mix. And it sounded like, you know, because you because you were focused. You, it was a, literally just black. You know, I wasn't, uh, I was helping them. There was no footage. It was just them. And I was, you know, you can close your eyes. You can hear and you can visualize this world coming together just from the soundtrack. So then we had the sound mix finished, you know, with the dialogue they had recorded of themselves, you know, saying different bits and parts um, based off a storyboard. And then once that was done, then... We threw in like just like uh, you know visual card placements of where the uh, the footage was going to go, and then so the kids were able to just focus on sort of the footage and knowing there's a dialogue track they can listen to. There was a playback, so they just lip synced it, so they didn't have to worry about you know trying to record sound at the time. It was kind of a weird reverse engineer thing, but it was an interesting exercise to see how um, for them to see how important this the sound was that. Um, and, and, and kind of reverse engineering it that way. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a really fun exercise. Yeah, there is a lot. Of, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty fun with these uh, good group of kids. But anyway, I thank you so much. You've spent. I I can't thank you enough. I know we've been trying to catch each other. I know you've been so busy. Um, and, but a lot of great information here, and uh, it's it's been an episode a lot of people have been asking about, and I've been I've been holding it off specifically just for you. I mean, I, I think I maybe could have found some other sound, you know, um, experts, but uh, I really wanted to to hear your story and hear what you had to say. So I'm thankful that you came on. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, <laughs> it's always a pleasure to to share some some sound uh, sound advice, if you will. Um, just because I. I, 
there's so much cool stuff out there. There's so much really, really amazing content being created that just has really terrible sound. Oh, yeah. Um, just beautiful, great stories, beautifully shot material. Just going on YouTube and just seeing something that someone does. And it's it's so much, there's so much interesting work and so many great ideas out there. But I think when people get to the sound aspect of it, you know, they kind of are, are like, okay, cool, what do I do? There's a microphone on the camera. Oh, yeah. And or, just having right. more of an idea of what goes into it and, and ways that they can pretty affordably take care of this and do right. things. I think my other, my pet peeve is like sort of fully on location. Like, like they use the same shotgun mug to just like pick up, they're, they're using the Foley that they hear. So if like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? They're not, they haven't isolated the dialogue, the track from the, everything else that's coming in. So that's why it sounds uh, incomplete. It sounds like tinny, like, mm-hmm. you know, like them walking doesn't sound very, you know, um, connected, you know, it's cause this one mic that picked up everything and they're like, well, that's a, that's the sound we recorded for that shot. Mm-hmm. We're going to use everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like it's been recorded. Like they're like the sound, you know, the, there's no nuance of the sounds of the clothing, the, the, the unique sound of the, the maybe a, a, a deeper bass mix for the, sound, the, the, you know, the footsteps, mm-hmm. um, all these types of things or, you know, but yeah. Yeah. It's fun if you could play with it. Uh, the reason, you know, I, I was excited because, you know, I'm with this podcast, uh, I've been able to, um, create sort of audio presentations with sound and music and it's a it's just fun that way it's like a you know a radio play but then you realize just the, the the world that you can create just through audio and then if you just add some a little bit of visuals it still could be impactful <laughs> it doesn't even have to be you know the high-end vis- uh, visuals but that's where mm-hmm. the power is i remember years ago when i was with sony playstation and we had a tour of skywalker ranch and got a chance to meet Randy Toms, one of the famous, you know, oh, yeah. sound legends. And he was, you know, he's whatever, he's done a lot of Pixar films and everything. But, you know, to be on that facility, to see uh, the, their sound mixing stage, and they were, at that time, they think they were mixing like an M. Night Shyamalan movie or something. So it, it was you know, hearing all the creepy sounds and stuff like that. And they had all these different projects they were running up there. But um, very eye opening, very, I feel very blessed to have an opportunity. Uh, to have that experience. Thank you so, so much. No problem. Thank you. That concludes my interview with sound supervisor and mix technician, Sam Edgness. I hope you got a lot of value out of this episode, but I know I did. I really liked hearing about getting the Zoom F8 multi-track field recorder for about, you know, $900, $1,000. The idea here is that isolating as many sound inputs as possible while you're on location, you know, to allow you for better mixing options later. I just thought, that's such a great concept to keep in mind. Well, most of us will probably only be working with a two-track recorder, but hopefully the concepts of what needs to be done to improve your audio while you're on location so that when you get into post-production, it makes it a lot easier. Um, I hope that, you know, that's one of the major takeaways that you got. That's what I got from it. And also, you know, speaking of like, you know, the film Tangerine, which was shot on an iPhone, had a really nice sound recording setup. I mean, they didn't skimp on that. So Think about spending more time, more budget on your sound recording equipment and, and, you know, talent and professionals or making sure you have enough friends to focus on the sound recording uh, before you go into production. Anyway, it can make a subpar picture recording feel like a million dollar movie. Now, I'm here to ask you for a favor. And if you haven't already, I could really use a rating review over on iTunes for the podcast. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes and that I'll take you to the iTunes page. And first, please subscribe to the podcast and then leave a rating and review. Uh, That's very, very helpful. And I really appreciate all those who have, you know, left a rating and review. And of course, as always, don't go away empty handed because if you are stuck trying to make your film right now, then I invite you to get this free gift over at freegearguide.com. It's an equipment list of everything I use to make a feature film for $500 without a crew Again, that's at freegearguide.com. Thank you so much for sticking around on this episode of the Film Trooper Podcast, and I will see you next time. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.